Welcome to Stanford Legal, where we look at the cases, questions, conflicts, and legal stories that affect us all every day. I'm Pam Carlin, along with Joe Bankman. Hey, Joe. Hi, Pam. Pam, you know, the big story that everyone asks me is, but how about the college admission scandal? What do you think of it? Stanford, like many schools, had some involvement in it. Are people buying their way into college? Yeah, it's been kind of amazing to to see how people have focused on these 35 families. I mean, I have to confess, I read the 210 pages of the uh, affidavit uh, in one sitting. I could not put it down. It was mesmerizing. My favorite line of all was when the guy who's selling the admissions thing says, look, I can get one of your kids into Stanford on the sailing team, but I can't do both of them because, you know, the sailing coach actually has to recruit some people who actually know how to sail. That's right. Um, And who knew we had a sailing team? But what we're going to do today is... Talk about the bigger scandal. Yes. Or at least the bigger issue, which is not just these 35 families, but how the entire admissions process works at elite institutions in the U.S. And we have with us as our guest today probably the best person in the country to talk about this. That's right. It's our uh, colleague and our old friend Rick Banks. He's a Jackson Eli Reynolds Professor of Law and Co-Associate Dean for Curriculum here at the Law School. He's a uh, Uh, writes books with gripping titles because they were about gripping subjects. Uh, How about this for a title? Is Marriage for White People? How the African-American Marriage Decline Affects Everyone. And he's got a forthcoming book that we're going to be talking about, Meritocracy in an Age of Inequality. And one of the things, Rick, that I love about your scholarship is not only is it accessible, but it also often has a very kind of counterintuitive twist to it. I mean, I remember just when you were first coming onto the job market, even your paper about adoption was one of the most thought-provoking papers I had read. And then your papers about race and uh, discussion of suspect, criminal suspects and criminal descriptions. So tell us a little bit about what your big thesis is in the book. Well, this is a, a book that I'm still trying to work through, but my uh, where I started the book actually was thinking about college admissions, uh, and in particular thinking about the role of race in college admissions. And that led to a broader set of inquiries about the role of universities in society, in particular the role of elite universities in society. Uh, and the question that I'm asking myself now is the gains and losses Uh, that as a society we experience by having so many universities that are so elite uh, and so wealthy uh, and an object of desire for so many high-achieving students. Well, and not just for high-achieving students. I mean, that was kind of the scandal of the scandal, right, is that these were an object of desire for students who weren't high-achieving students. This is true. <laughs> is that the um, you know the 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 context here? Uh, I think what leads parents to to try to game the system as they have is that you know college admissions has become more and more competitive than, than ever, and that's not because potential college students have increased so dramatically because the numbers have increased. It's really because students and their families now increasingly aspire towards so-called top colleges. There's a stronger sense than ever of what those top colleges are. Uh, we forget that when I even applied to college in, in the 1980s, there was no U.S. News and World Report. Uh, there was no ranking. People had a sense of, you know, different qualities of different schools, but there wasn't a sense of a rigid hierarchy. Now there is. Uh, there's an actual numbered list, and ambitious students uh, and parents know the list and consult uh, that list. Uh, this, uh, the development of this educational hierarchy has been spurred in part by the two different factors. One is uh, the, the spread of a market for education, which is driven by big issues and mundane issues. Mundane issues would be like the falling cost of communication, right? Once long distance calls become cheap and air travel becomes cheap, people can travel. So we had, since the 1980s, a national market in education develop where the best students could think about going across the country more than going to their regional school. Well, and global too. And right? globally as well. People could think about leaving their country. Uh, and the, the other big change uh, is the r- changing role of education in the labor market. Uh, education used to be a marker of status. 
uh, a marker of being elite. Now it's a mechanism of status. Uh, the link between education and income has grown ever stronger over our lifetimes. Uh, parents and students are very much aware that if you can gain admission to Stanford or even USC, you have an, you have an economic trajectory that is much different than if you don't. Is, is that actually true for upper middle class students? I seem to have read somewhere that um, if you take two students who both got into an elite uh, an elite mm -hmm. college, one of them went there and the other one didn't, their earning potential the, over the course of their lifetime tends to be pretty similar. That, that there's not a huge amount for upper middle class students. There is for working class kids and poor kids, but for upper middle class students, where you go to college doesn't actually say very much about how much you'll earn later, holding constant mm -hmm. whatever you're uh, abilities were your scores and your, I think the, I think yeah. the, the the latter part of what you said is clearly the case the the, the claim that this is an area of active research uh, economists differ as to uh, the effects of education for different categories of students so but I think it is clearly the case that the benefits of elite education are greatest for those who are from low socioeconomic backgrounds or otherwise disadvantaged, right? And you can see a lot of reasons why that would be so, because in addition to what you learn while you're at a university, uh, part of the value of education is also the signaling value and also the networking value. The fact that you become part of a, a universe of other kids who also have opportunities and that can help you later professionally. Uh, one of the, the great, uh, you know, problems that the book highlights, which Pam, you alluded to earlier, is that while we might focus in this recent uh, controversy highlights the role of outright fraud in the admissions process, people making up uh, uh, athletic profiles and fabricating admissions scores and so forth, there's a much more subtle and pervasive way in which money yeah, enters the process, obviously. I mean, if we're going to have a sailing team at, at Stanford, which, obviously all of the people who are going to be on the sailing team are going to be upper middle class or wealthy because who else can afford sailing lessons for their kids and yep. a sailboat and the like to begin with? That's exactly right. And, and college sports at elite schools represent a... Uh, larger segment of the student population than many people might imagine, right? So if you look at a place like Ohio State or Michigan, of course, while there are lots of athletes there, they are a small percentage of the student body. But if you look at elite private schools, uh, the percentage of students who are admitted for sports may be 20%, even 25% at some places. Uh, because although the school may be small, they have lots of teams. And the and yeah, that's I think I one way in which money the, plays a role. The, the game of life, that the place that had the largest athletic preferences in admission were places like Williams and Amherst, where they to just staff the teams at a really small school. I mean, you got to have 11 people on your side of the field for football, whether you have a student body of 45,000 or a student body of 2,000. And here's a trick question. What's the fastest growing sport on our college campuses? Lacrosse. It is lacrosse. I was going to guess that. It, it is lacrosse. So lacrosse upset, coach at a private credit. school and, in Connecticut. So and, and, and it is lacrosse for a complicated set of reasons, but we could simplify it and say it is lacrosse because – Parents who have a lot of money are more likely to have children who play lacrosse. Having had two sons who play lacrosse, there is an economic uh, profile of yeah. lacrosse parents that is different from the economic profile of basketball parents or, or parents of football players. Uh, Can I just step here and say this is Stanford Legal, and today we're talking with our guest Rick Banks about college admissions and meritocracy in an age of inequality. But you were saying, Rick, about the about the lacrosse players. Well, lacrosse. So no. So the, so their parents. Which is not who, an expensive sport in terms of equipment at all. Lacrosse so actually kind of is a very expensive sport because the way you get noticed in lacrosse is to go to tournaments that yeah. require. Lots of travel, lots of hotel stays, uh, and lots of coaching, frankly. Yeah. Uh, the best lacrosse coaches in the Bay Area uh, earn more money than any sane parent would want to pay, um, unless that parent has a lot of money and is really into lacrosse. Uh, maybe my brother should move out here. <laughs> so the, um, and, and, then it, and then it makes sense from the school's perspective, because part of the model of elite universities, and this is how they became elite, is to create a circumstance where 
uh, alumni donations can eventually constitute a substantial part of the pot of economic resources of the institution, right? So that at the most elite institutions, 30 or even 40 percent of the operating costs are paid for out of the endowment, which of course is uh, the consequence of alumni donations. And people who have a good experience on the lacrosse team and bond with their with their teammates, they're very likely to become donors in the future. So it, it's rational for the university they, to admit athletes from elite backgrounds. I just kind of wonder whether that we could skip over that middle step and say uh, admitting wealthy people makes it more likely that they'll have money at the back end to give you if they have a good experience whether they're athletes or not right well well that certainly happens too and and you know and every school frankly does that uh, even those schools who are need blind in admissions where they don't pay attention to the need of the applicants none of them as far as i know are resource blind uh, and that's important to take account of. So let me jump in here. Suppose I'm an admissions officer and somebody comes across my file and the last name is Bezos and they've got the right address. I know that that parent could really float our boat, so to speak, and not just a sailboat. He could build uh, some medical equipment that could cure cancer. He could fund scholarships. What's the trade? What's our right moral answer? What What should I do? Should I Should I not admit the kid? Should I be indifferent? So it, So let's be clear that 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 student would be admitted okay. to most any university. So it's really not a question. And so and the and the and you know there's a lot of outrage. There would be a lot yeah. of outrage if that were to be known, right? Yeah. And if the university were to say this is how we admit students. Yeah. My view though is that that's actually a justifiable decision to admit that student because the category of students who are as an as a development officer might say uh, from families able to make a transformative gift. Yeah. That's actually a very small number of students. Mm -hmm. And to 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 be realistic, that's what the university depends on. Yeah. Universities that are elite would not be elite had they not admitted the children of those families. And those students are, it's a small number. They don't take a lot of slots from other kids. So the benefit cost calculus there weighs in favor of admitting the student. The larger problem, which Pam alluded to earlier, is that we have lots of other so-called legitimate bases yeah. of admission, which very predictably skew to those who are already advantaged, already have resources, and are also the least likely to benefit from the uh, uh, atmosphere that the school provides. And that's, that's because the schools look at things like how many AP courses you took, and that'll depend on whether the yep. school you went to offers AP courses. I mean, I remember at one point, it turned out that a student could have a perfect record in high school and couldn't get into Berkeley if they had a 1200 SAT score, because at 1200 SAT, you had to have a GPA over 4.0, which could only be achieved by having uh, AP courses. And if you went to a, a school in a poor school district, you literally could have had a perfect score on every test you got from ninth grade to 12th grade, mm -hmm. and you still couldn't get the GPA you needed to get into. This is exactly, and, I, and I, I illustrate this same point in, in, the, in, the, in the 14th Amendment when I talk about the University of Michigan affirmative action cases, right? This is a challenge to admissions at the University of Michigan. I actually use the, the admissions grid that they use there, and they have points for, for AP courses and having a, having a challenging curriculum and so forth. And then I have a discussion with the students about well, how many high schools in the city of Detroit do you think offer the curriculum so students could get the maximum points on this grid? And, and the answer, of course, is low to none. This is Stanford Legal, and today we're talking with our colleague Rick Banks about meritocracy, college admissions, and an a, a, in an age of inequality. Joe? Rick, I want to come back to athletics before we leave it, because a lot of people, when they think about athletics, think about the big sports like football, which tend to be more at least racially balanced and diverse than sports like lacrosse. But what you're telling us is that in practice, athletics means this wide array of sports. It's taking up a lot of space. And instead of helping diversity, it's actually hurting diversity. Is that, am I hearing that right or getting that right? That, that is correct. Most uh, college athletes are uh, playing sports like lacrosse, field hockey, squash, tennis, water polo, soccer, and so forth. Uh, because to, to do well in all of those sports, having parental resources behind you helps. 
ap- uh, applicants who excel in those sports are more likely to be white. They're more likely to be upper middle class or upper class. And um, that does skew uh, admissions racially towards some groups and away from others. And this is one of the issues, by the way, that arose in the recent Harvard litigation, uh, where Harvard University was sued uh Uh, for taking account of race in their admissions process. I mean, one of the things that's striking is um, some of our listeners know I just recently got back from Italy is we're the only country in the world where the athletics programs for 18 to 21 year olds are run through universities. Everywhere Mm -hmm. else in the world, that has nothing to do with your admission to universities. And even things like alumni preferences often don't. So for example, as I understand, Oxford and Cambridge do not give preferences to the children of alumni of the various colleges. And yet that's a huge thing in the United States. And another way to to think about this is we teach at a law school. And so we get students who are just a little bit older than the students that get, get, get athletic preferences. But if someone came to our law school and said, this student wouldn't otherwise get in, but they're great at lacrosse, we'd look at them like, fine, but that's not relevant to us. So it's very interesting how ingrained a feature of education. I mean, your it partner is, but... wrote a wonderful article about we don't let people into college because they're great cooks. That's right. Anybody that wants to look at uh, Barbara Freed's article in Journal of Higher Education can find that it's a It's a wonderful article. I, I agree with all you said, but but there is a, a conflict here, right, which is that the, the financial model of elite universities, and in some sense the greatness of our elite universities, is very much tied in to the primacy given to athletics and to the primacy given to potential donations. Uh, that's not a bug in the system. That's actually a feature of the system. So this then raises the question you had said earlier, you know, uh, athletes are displacing students who might otherwise have gotten in. And the question is, which kinds of displacement are okay and which kinds of displacement aren't okay? So uh, letting in the person from North Dakota because we want somebody from all 50 states, we don't hear much argument, you can't let in people from North Dakota. Uh, We do hear these arguments more and more about alumni. And of course, we've all... often heard these about athletes, but we, where we really hear this is about uh, race-conscious uh, affirmative action admissions. Um, and I think, you know, after our break, we'll come back to that. But I guess the question is, should colleges be letting in the very best students, or is there something else that they should be thinking about? I take it your view is there's a blend of different qualities that they should be looking for in a class, and one of those is capacity to give money to the institution later on that will benefit other people at the institution and presumably society as a whole because knowledge is produced. That is correct. And another thing is helping people that you can benefit the most, which I heard you say, and that's the marginal benefit of a Stanford education tends to be greater for the poor kid than the wealthy kid. Yeah, I mean, there was this really interesting article that Tobias Wolf and Robert Paul Wolf wrote that said, if you go to an emergency room and two people go in and one has a pimple on his nose and the other one's bleeding to death, they say, we should give our resources to the person who's bleeding to death. But when you look at, you know, where should a university put its scarce admissions resources, they want to give it to the person who has the pimple on the nose, not the person who's bleeding to death. And I think what, what you're both highlighting here very well is that there is a divergence between individual institutions' interests and what we might think of as a societal interest. And this is a place where we shouldn't expect rational behavior by institutions to correspond to what we might see as socially optimal outcomes. We'll be back with more from our guest, Rick Banks, uh, talking about meritocracy and an age of inequality and admission to higher education institutions next on Stanford Legal here on Sirius XM Insight 121. Welcome back to Stanford Legal, where we look at the cases, questions, conflicts, and legal stories that affect us all every day. I'm Pam Carlin, along with Joe Bankman. Pam, before the break, we were talking with Rick Banks, who's continued to join us now. And Rick, you started off by talking about how people have changed their position on the desirability and necessity to get to the best schools. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Well, in, in short, the, the market for higher education used to be a regional market. 
uh, people to go to schools near to them. Uh, making a trip across the country was time consuming. It was costly. Staying in touch uh, once you left home, that was also costly. I remember my older sister went to college and whenever we talked to her, even though she was only a hundred or two miles away, we had to always keep the phone calls short because long distance was really expensive. Uh, as these things changed, the market for students became national rather than regional. And what we also saw is st as schools began to, to be able to attract students from farther away, schools began to compete more with each other. The result here 30, 40 years later is that we have more stratification of universities than we have ever had. And that's true along many different dimensions. One simple metric of that is just to look at university endowments. Uh, it used to be that the ratio of the endowment of a really good school to a you know, less good school, so to speak, was maybe two to one. Now it might be 10 to one or 20 to one. Uh, higher education is a place where, as in society generally, over the last 30 or 40 years, the rich have really gotten a lot richer. So it's kind of mirrored, in some sense, what's happening outside of education. And it doesn't just mirror what's happening outside of education. It, in fact, is partly caused by what's happening outside of education. Uh, university fundraising, while we imagine, just as people do in the voting context, that you have lots of small donations, right, in fundraising, in fact, most universities, those at the top, their fundraising is, is shaped now by an ever smaller number of very high net worth donors who can make large gifts, right? And so you're talking about, thank you, what's rational for the university is to go after those donors and to become number one. I think you gave me a figure putting names on it, the ratio of Harvard's to BYU, uh, BU's endowment. BYU. Right, and this endowment. then this yeah. is this is just an estimate for an yeah. purposes of example. Maybe that was two to one in in nineteen seventy. Now it might be ten to one or twenty to one even. So it's rational for Stanford, but how about society? What what's what's the right move for society on this? Front? That's the big question. Uh, in our society, we have extraordinary faith in the market. I mean, we, we some of us believe that markets solve all problems. Uh, but just as we've seen in the economic realm that markets might create problems as they solve problems, we also should ask in the realm of higher education, what are the costs and benefits of the increasing stratification that we've seen across universities? There are clearly some gains uh, or Arguably, there are some gains to this increased stratification. Uh, we have universities like Stanford and Harvard and, and other peers who offer opportunities for students that would have been unimaginable decades ago. At the same time, there are some costs of that level of stratification as well. One consequence of this stratification is that we have students who are ever more obsessed with getting into the very top school, uh, the desire to reach the top school is likely affecting their choices when they're in high school or prior to enrolling in terms of the activities they undertake, the sports they undertake, uh, even their choice of courses, right? Students might have become very risk averse in, the, in the, an effort to assemble the very best transcript. We might also wonder whether there's a mental health or psychological cost uh, to the obsession with elite universities. So. Do elite universities produce something that they wouldn't be able to produce that's socially beneficial if they weren't as elite? That is the big question, and we should separate the, the research function on one hand from the teaching function on the other. We're talking now about the teaching educational function. And there, you know, we might think of elite universities as engaging in a very extreme form of tracking, which is to say students are, are clustered within a fairly narrow achievement realm. Universities have become much more stratified as well in terms of student achievement. That is, the highest achieving students now are at a much smaller group of schools than would have been the case 30 or 40 years ago. And then the question is, are those students going to do better when they're clustered with other students, quote, like them educationally than if they were in a more uh, heterogeneous environment? And, you know, the research that when we look at primary schools is Maybe not so much. Uh, there, there's not so much of a gain from clustering on the basis of achievement. This is Stanford Legal, and today we're talking with our guest, Rick Banks, about meritocracy, college admissions, and what goes on in an age of inequality. And because this is a show called Stanford Legal, we probably should talk about the lawsuit that's getting the most attention now about these issues, which is a lawsuit challenging 
the admissions process at Harvard for undergraduate admissions, it's not the typical challenge to affirmative action in that the claim in the lawsuit is not directly that affirmative action is unconstitutional, but it's a claim that Harvard has been discriminating against Asian American applicants. Uh, and it's done so through so-called personal scores. That is, the Asian American applicants have higher uh, test scores, they have better grades, and yet they're not getting in at the same rate as uh, white applicants or as uh, other applicants of color. What do you make of this lawsuit, Rick? Well, it's, it's a fascinating lawsuit that once again you know, galvanizes uh, lots of attention. Uh, the plaintiffs in the case, uh, which is as you described, they have a, 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 a tough challenge uh, because the challenge is ultimately going to be statistical. Uh, and they're going to have to try to prove through statistics that there has been some purposeful discrimination in the admissions process in a way that's, that's intended to, to cap or limit uh, or, or racially balance within the class. Uh, if they can prove that, then they will prevail. But proving that will be very difficult uh, for them to do. I mean, one of the things that was interesting there is reading the complaint in that case, which was almost novelistic in its descriptions going back to the turn of the century, because, of course, Harvard did used to do exactly that, uh, not to keep out Asian-American immigrant I I applicants, but to keep out Jewish applicants. And exactly. that's actually where a lot of the sports uh, focus at elite universities started to come in as they said, well, we want to let in more people who do sports and, you know, Jewish kids from Manhattan were not doing a lot of sports then. Right. And, and the implications of this suit are uh, perhaps more political than they are legal. Right. I mean, the plaintiff has the burden of proof, so it's going to be very difficult for them to prevail legally. But one consequence of the suit is that a lot of information about the admissions process of a place like Harvard will kind of seep out into the public consciousness and people will feel conflicted about what they see there. Yeah, and, and, the, and the, the level of preference for alumni children and for uh, athletes was one of the really stunning things uh, that came out during the trial. Yes, and that, again, this, this all cuts against the mythology which we attach to education that a place like Harvard is where uh, people go once they've earned admission based on their hard-won achievement uh, so that they can then do great things for society. So uh, a better world, uh, described by your book, would be a world in which maybe we bring back the great regional schools and have less of a, a focus on the meritocracy of the kind of competitive market where everybody strives to be number one. Joe, you're hitting close to home here. So as we sit here on Stanford's campus, uh, but but and, and this close to home personally for me because part of my initial impetus for for thinking about this book was to was reflections on how education had changed my life. Uh, and education partly was able to change my life because I did well on the exams and did all the stuff that we imagine students can do uh, as they move through the system. But when we think about the question of what would be a better world, my, my intuition is, uh, and this will be the argument of the book, frankly, is that just as we would have a better society if we had a less economically stratified society, we could have a better system of higher education if we had a less stratified system of higher education. We have a system now that we expect to promote equality, racial equality and to promote social mobility, and it doesn't really do either well. The stratification that we have, in fact, more tends to perpetuate pre-existing advantages rather than to undermine them. Well, it's it's been so great having you, Rick, and uh, it's an important book, and it is a book that hits home as we, lucky enough to be at Stanford, think about what education is doing, how it's become increasingly stratified, and whether the rationality at the individual school level, Stanford trying to be the best, is a rationality we want at the social level. So thanks so much, Rick, for being with us. And thanks to our listeners for joining us here on Stanford Legal on Sirius XM Insight 121.